I was going to introduce Maud, but she's here, so. <laughs> and she needs no introduction, although she is a longtime Canadian water activist known worldwide and the recipient of many honors for that. And she has some good news today, as well as lots of other stuff to tell us. Thank you very much, Adam. Uh, and thank you, everyone. First of all, can you hear me? How's the sound? Oh, great. Uh, Judah, thank you for that. That was fabulous. And your book looks wonderful, and I, I love the cover. I mean, that is just absolutely beautiful. It's, it's inviting, and it's, it's hopeful. So thank you so much for that. And it's just a, a pleasure to be here, a particular pleasure to be here with two old friends, Rajendra and my, Mikhail. You are going to just be knocked out by the, <clears throat> the quality of the, the presentations you're going to hear um, this weekend. So COP21 is coming up uh, in Paris in five weeks, my goodness. A number of us are going to be there trying to tell the water story. But I'll tell you, it's a hard thing because most of it, this is something that uh, Adam said, and thank you, Adam, for all the work that you and your team have done to put this together. Um, Adam made the point that climate scientists and climate activists tend to think about climate problems only in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. So we're always saying, and water, and water, and, and we'll be doing so. Um, and when you, when you get climate people talking about water, it's usually only as in what is the impact of global warming on water. So what we're trying to do here, I think, is to try to change the conversation a bit, in a, both in a, in, a, in a way of looking at the, the impact of our abuse of water and what it's doing to climate, and then how we can use it as a solution. So what is the situation for water globally? Well, we are uh, in some trouble. Um, in fact, you could say that in some parts of the world, we're actually running out. We are polluting, mismanaging, uh, displacing, and most importantly, diverting water from where nature put it and where it's necessary for a healthy hydrologic cycle to function to where we want it. And I mean, probably California is the very best example of that. This is the most diverted place on Earth in terms of water being moved around by pipeline and aqueduct and so on, so they can export lots and lots of almonds to the world. Uh, we're damming our rivers to death. Most major rivers no longer reach the ocean. Much of this is for industrial-based global food market. Um, and one of the important stories for us to know about is virtual water, and that's the water that's embedded in everything that we produce, but particularly in commodities. So if you're growing food commodities for export, you are exporting not just the commodity, but the water out of your uh, watershed. And it's a very big part of the story, uh, and a very big part of the solution is local sustainable food production. We're also pumping our groundwater and aquifers absolutely relentlessly. We're doubling the taking, the mining of groundwater every 20 years. And I think it's important to stop and remember that we didn't have bore well technology to be able to do that even 70 years ago. It's really quite a new thing to have the kind of technology where we can go so deep into the ground and take up massive amounts of water using circular a bore well technology, they, they greened the prairies in, in North America and pulled up massive amounts of water and, and basically turned hard scrabble farming into this uh, wonderful oasis. The problem is it doesn't last. Once the water's gone, you go back to what, what you had. There's a new NASA study. Uh, NASA has used satellite, satellite technology that's quite new, and they're actually able to say where the water, groundwater is, and there are, they have identified 37 major aquifers in the world, and they said that one-third of them are in crisis, literally um, running out, um, and another eight are in, in very serious trouble. Uh, over half of the major rivers in China have disappeared um, since 1990, which is pretty stunning if you stop and think about it. And this isn't climate change as related to greenhouse gas emissions. This is over-pumping for uh, food, for all the production of all the stuff that they export, but also uh, hydroelectric uh, uh, operations for coal mining. The Ogallala Aquifer here in the United States, which goes down the spine of, of the Midwest, and which produces so much food for people and so much food for export, 
um, is in terrible trouble. There are 200,000 bore wells going 24-7, and last year the Department of Agriculture, their Ogallala Center, said there's really no way to save it, that it's too late and it'll be gone probably within 50 to 60 years, and it's only a case of adaptation. Again, this is not climate change as we, as we understand it. This is over-extraction of a limited water source. The Aral Sea was once the fourth largest lake in the world. It was in the former Soviet Union, so big it was called a sea. And Lake Chad in Africa was the sixth biggest, and both of them are dec declined around 90%, again, over-extraction for flood irrigation. So I think it's really important for us to understand that we are taking massive bodies of water, whole watersheds, whole aquifers, and uh, removing the water from them. Now, why are we doing this? Well, I think there's a couple of answers, and Judith uh, spoke to it, um, I, I think, very, very well. And one of them is the myth of abundance. We all grew up, and I can still remember in grade six the, the hydrologic cycle, the little diagram was a little cartoon, and it looked like the earth was surrounded by this big river, and you could just stick your straw in and take as much as you wanted. And we have this myth, and particularly in places like my country, in Canada, we just feel that we can do, um, we can do whatever we want with water. And also, I think the more modern, the particularly Western uh, culture feels that there'll always be a, um, a, a technology to fix it. Whatever we break, um, technology will come along and fix it. But I think more importantly, we see water as a resource for our pleasure, convenience, and profit. And so water is to be used to promote a, neck, a form of, of economic and industrial development that is, is so destructive to the planet. I noted that an advisor to President Roosevelt when they were building the great big dams in the United States said that they would have to learn to conquer water. To become great, America would have to learn to conquer its water. The water would be, they would have to um, bring water under control as they were doing to soil and, and other resources. So it's a way of looking at water instead of seeing it as the essential element in a living ecosystem, we see it as its service to us. Now, the impact on, on this behavior on people and communities has been profound, and that's more been the kind of work I've done. I've been deeply involved in the human right to water. I was involved in the struggle to successful struggle campaign to get the United Nations to recognize the human rights to water and sanitation, and it was a, a damn hard struggle, I'll tell you. You could think that it's a motherhood, but thank you. <clears throat> I wasn't doing it for that, but I, I for all the people who, who work so hard on it. But honestly, you think it's a motherhood, but we had powerful countries like my own and your own at the time, although the U.S. is, is much better now. Uh, big water companies, the World Bank, all in total opposition. I mean, it was really quite a, 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 a huge struggle to get this to happen. But what we've seen with this kind of industrial development of water is the massive displacement of peasants, small farmers, indigenous people, villagers, all over the world as we've brought in land grabs. There's been a land and water, and I always think of land grabs as also being water grabs, three times the size of Great Britain in Africa alone. And that's displaced many millions of people. Um, and of course, they're using the same bore well technology there for their groundwater as we're using and destroying our groundwater here. Uh, with all those free trade zones, tourist areas, dams, mining operations, millions and millions of people have moved to the peri-urban slums of the major cities of the world. And a new report says that by about 2040, over half the people living in major cities will be slum dwellers. And for most of them, all they will have in terms of access to water will be about one small bathtub full of water per day per person. And in many, many, many cases, they have no legal access to water or sanitation because they simply don't have, it's not recognized as a settlement um, in itself. And that's one of the things that we're promoting with the human right to water is the extension of this concept. Right now in our world, more children die of waterborne disease than of all forms of violence, including war. Um, so it continues to be an enormous human rights issue. And we're also seeing the corporate capture of water. Um, the perfect storm, Judith talked of one, here's another, and that is declining water supplies globally, but particularly in some places more than other. An increased division between rich and poor in our country, both between countries but within countries, so people can't afford water if it's priced. And then the privatization of water, which means that you're getting 
uh, for-profit utility companies coming in and, and delivering water but saying no to anyone who can't afford it. And if you think it's just in the global south, think again. We have uh, thousands of people who've had their water turned off in Europe due to the austerity program. You can't pay your increased water bill, you get your water turned off. Many cities in the United States now are turning water off. I was deeply involved in the fight in Detroit where at one point last summer they were cutting the water off to 3,000 families a day. We're talking people living in with, you know, literally having the, 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 the water staff come in at six in the morning and just cut an entire block off and leave and there you are, no water. Doesn't matter if you have kids, doesn't matter if you have elderly, doesn't matter if you have people who are ill, no water. And we're talking about an inner city where a million people have left uh, most of the money uh, and what's left has, has been mostly African American, the poorest people in the United States, because they didn't have the, the numbers uh, for the base, for the tax base, they tripled the price of water and then said, well, if you can't pay it, we're turning your water off. So it's very important that we start to understand that this truly is a global issue um, more and more uh, with, all, with every passing day. Now, what has this to do with climate? Well, it has everything to do with climate. As you're going to hear this weekend, when we remove water from water retentive landscapes or when we remove vegetation from water retentive landscapes, we affect the local hydrologic cycle in a really terrible way. We create drought and we increase desertification, which in turn creates uh, war uh, global warming. So it's very important that we understand that, it, that our abuse of water is not just a result of climate change, but one of the major causes of climate change. And I'm going to give you two examples. One is the Dust Bowl of the 1930s. Now what we all know and we all learned was that they took down massive amounts of prairie grass in a very short period of time for development and the, the, the topsoil uh, dried up and blew away. Everybody knows that. What everybody thought until quite recently was at the same time there was a coincidental drought. And it's really important for us to know now that studies tell us no, the drought wasn't a coincidence. The drought was a direct result of the process of removing that prairie grass, removing the ability of that cycle, that hydrologic cycle to work as it should. And what, became, what, what might have been a slight downturn in rain became the tragedy that we all know it did. The other example is, and I think this is the most important water story in the world, is from Brazil. If you were to ask scientists up till maybe 10 years ago, what's the most water rich country in the world, they would tell you Brazil. Haven't had a drought in recorded history with the odd, you know, one year, you know, slight drought, but this is a country with, with water, right? Um, they've had such severe drought in the last 10 years that there's just a whole new language and a whole new reality they're dealing with. The city of Sao Paulo is in the south of Brazil. Greater Sao Paulo has 20 million people. The greater valley area affected by this drought has 40 million people. They have run out of water. Look it up. Google it. Look it up. Sao Paulo is running out of water. The reservoir is gone. The river is, is either totally polluted or um, gone. Now what happened, again, this is not climate change as we get it described. People will say, oh, it's climate change. But this is the abuse of water in two ways. One of them is that they have overextracted their groundwater to produce um, uh, sugarcane ethanol. It takes a huge amount of water to produce ethanol. The same thing on the Ogallala. We should not be growing the amount of corn and producing the amount of corn ethanol take 1,700 gallons of water to produce one gallon of corn ethanol. That's where the water's going in the Ogallala. Same thing in, in Brazil. And it's for export, not just to use at home. But the other thing that they've done is that they've allowed the destruction of the rainforest. Now, it's really important to understand that rainforests create an enormous amount of moisture that is carried by currents that scientists call flying rivers. I love the concept of flying rivers. And these rivers suck up that moisture and they move that moisture, that, those flying rivers, thousands of miles away and they deposit that rain on Sao Paulo. They have destroyed those flying rivers by destroying the rainforest. And this is, so this is a cycle 
that is extraordinarily, a process, as Judith called it, that is extraordinarily uh, important for us to understand. In essence, climate change has been only partially diagnosed, and I want to underline what, what, um, what uh, Adam said at the beginning. Now we need, to add, uh, we need to add our analysis of what we've done to water, but also look at how restoring water cycles, protection of watersheds, restoration of watersheds, restoration of water retentive landscapes can be actually one of the solutions. And it can be a joyful solution. It can be something that we do that gives us hope. And I think both previous speakers spoke about the negativity that, that wears us down. <clears throat> what we need is a new water ethic, and I'm not going to talk about it now because the time on, I'm going to have another chance to speak with you on, on, um, on Sunday morning. I'll talk a little bit more about it and what are the basic principles, but fundamentally, we have to build all policies and practices around the question of what is the impact on water. And if the impact on water isn't good, we need to say then we've got to go back to the drawing boards. We have all of our governments have all, are all separated. You've got the people with the agribusiness and promoting agriculture here, and you've got the trade people here, and you've got the energy people here, and if there's any scientists or environmentalists left in government, they're over here in a little building and nobody talks to them. <clears throat> so nobody asks the question when we sign these trade agreements, and don't get me started on trade agreements, you won't get me off here. <laughs> With these trade agreements put our water and put all of what we're doing at risk because what happens is these corporations under tra trade agreements like NAFTA and the new TTIP and the new P TPP allow even more corporations to sue their governments, or, or foreign governments, if those governments bring in any of the kinds of prog programs we're talking about here. So it's very important for us to ask, uh, through the lens of water, what are these trade agreements? How do we grow food? How do we produce energy? Uh, and we need uh, some major purpose of this weekend, then, is to put the story of water on the climate map, to empower people to help restore local watersheds and ecosystems, and perhaps most importantly, to bring us out of our silos, because I have watched this in my work. You've got the people working on water as a, from a scientific or environmental point of view, water, people working on water as a human right, and I found even those two are, are often just at, at, you know, two silos. But then you've got the climate people over here, and they say, no, no, I'm busy with greenhouse gas emissions, and we, we need to pull our, our, ourselves away from these silos. So I'm thrilled to be here with you and to share um, this weekend. Um, I think it's a, a, an extraordinarily important thing that you've done, Adam, and your team bringing us all together. Um, and it's now my pleasure to introduce uh, Michael Kravsik, whom I have had, I've known since I were thinking, we're thinking 2000, the year 2000, when we met at, there's a bad guys called the World Water Council. And the World Water Council <clears throat> get together every three years. They have a World Water Forum, and it's basically just a big show for the big water companies, the bottled water companies, and so on. And Michael and I have had a great, and Rajendra have had great fun uh, making as much trouble as we can at every single one of these um, events every three years. Michael is a Slovakian uh, hydrologist. He's a Goldman Prize winner, but what you need to know, he is one of the leaders, the global leaders, really, in our world, telling us and leading us in a campaign to save the Earth's hydrologic cycle by watershed restoration. His Blue Alternative Project in Slovakia is uh, unparalleled and something he's going to talk about and one of the signs of hope. So Michael will give you, like I did, some scary reality, but the hope that um, comes from this kind of gathering. So I give you Michael and I thank you very much for uh, your hospitality here.